This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Well, not exactly City Talk. In fact, not at all. We're back in the Middle East. Recent headlines tell part of the story. Israel and Hamas fire and ceasefire in a new Middle East. Peace after the Arab Spring? Will the Israel-Hamas ceasefire last? Morsi asserts new powers and orders ex-officials retried. Egypt judges call for nationwide strike. Finally, cold ravages Syria refugees as aid falters. It's winter. Wither the Arab Spring. To help clarify a very complex and fast-moving situation is a welcome guest here, Richard Murphy, former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Mauritania, Syria, and the Philippines. He has served as U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern and South Asian Affairs. He has been named Career Ambassador. He has been a senior fellow for the Middle East at the Council on Foreign Relations. And Ambassador Murphy is a frequent TV commentator and widely consulted expert and a frequent guest here. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Thanks a lot. Over the last three weeks, the world's least stable region becoming less so and becoming more violent. What's going on? Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Well, it really all started almost two years back, this present uh, uh, series of upsets with the overturn of the government in Tunis, then in Cairo, <clears throat> on to Libya, and the startup of the fighting in Syria. Um, the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, which uh, it's a term Americans like. It's, been, it's caught on. It's, it's really opened a period of transition. Mm -hmm. uh, and events are just starting to become clear as to where the area is heading. But it's, it's, it's not surprising that after half a century of domination by certain leaders in the area <clears throat> that um, it looks like everything's unhinged and everybody's ready to fight with everyone else. It, it certainly does. And part of this Arab Spring has been the rise of Islamic populism. And we'll talk a little bit about that in reference to Egypt. In a sense, the price of democracy, quote unquote, or at least elections. So what happened was this liberalization, or at least the ability to vote, has created governments that are much more responsible to the Arab street and, and Islamic populism. Yeah, well, I mean, Egypt ran a free election uh, which brought in the Muslim Brotherhood from a position of years back having been condemned as a violent terrorist organization to a secret party to finally getting elected and representing the, uh, if not major um, opinion, a heavy enough vote that uh, they, they won the election. So within the last couple of weeks, we've had the military engagement between Gaza and Israel with an assassination of a military leader by the Israelis, response by the, uh, the Gazans, Hamas, with uh, missiles and rockets into uh, Israel, and then massive Israeli strikes, and then you have a ceasefire. One of the things that we've often talked about is the, the American role in the Middle East. And we seem to be the, still the indispensable piece in this puzzle. Uh, okay, if, could we have seen a ceasefire without uh, Secretary of State Clinton jetting off to Cairo and uh, Jerusalem? Um, it certainly helped. The indispensable role, I would argue, this time was more in Egypt. Sure, sure. With the changes that have taken place there. 
Meaning what? What were the changes? What were the actions? And how did uh, President Morsi sort of walk that line, both in terms of, quote unquote, supporting Hamas, but at the same time recognizing its relationship to Israel and the United States? I mean, that's pretty, pretty fancy footwork. Well, he's, he's still finding his way. And as we've seen in the last few days, uh, he can make some major missteps with Egyptian public opinion. Wow. And some of the things he said about uh, uh, Israel and uh, Palestine in the beginning of the upheavals were troubling in Washington. But at the, at the end of the day, uh, if you want to call it that way, uh, he apparently played a very substantial part in securing the conditions for the ceasefire. And it was recognized in the joint press conference yep. uh, between... Uh, with him and Secretary of State uh, Clinton. So right. clearly there was much mutual support. And in fact, I read somewhere the Israeli, uh, the Egyptian foreign minister praised the United States for its active and successful engagement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is, is what, what role does Egypt now play? Is it in some sense a reliable ally or is it a, you know, and an interested ally who, whose interest happened to coincide with ours in this case. Well, that's one definition of being an ally. Your interests coincide. Okay. Side. okay. And, uh, sure. Uh, Call me to task. Well, no. What no, what happened was uh, uh, he had to weigh uh, the interest he has in a good relationship with the United States, reflect the will of the people that brought him into office, and it wasn't just uh, reflecting the will of the Brotherhood. Uh, you have to go back and realize that the peace treaty between Israel uh, and Egypt was not wildly popular, widely popular in Egypt. Mm -hmm. It was between the leaderships. Right. And uh, the, uh, the Brotherhood, among others, was very critical of, of the treaty when it was uh, uh, brought into being. Now it says uh, it should be amended or they should review the provisions of the treaty. But no talk of tearing it up and walking away from what was set out in 1979. Israeli reactions to potential changes in the strategic relationship? Well, I'm sure they're uneasy. And I, I think they've been super cautious in uh, exploring new possibilities. Uh, they've been, I would say, waiting for the dust to settle before mm -hmm. Uh, anything making their point in the case of the shootout in Gaza that nothing's changed. We're going to uh, play a, the role of defending the, this is the Israeli government, mm -hmm. our security, and uh, come hell or high water, uh, that that role is critical. And look what we can do. And they rocketed and they bombed and they threatened to move in a ground force into Gaza. I know it's too early. Who won? Did anyone win? And if they did win, what did they win? Uh, I think I think Egypt won. Go ahead. Did, I, th I think definition? Egypt won in the sense that uh, uh, it showed it could have a leverage with Hamas, which Mubarak did not have. Mubarak mm -hmm. did not like Hamas at all and was... Well, they were uh, a threat. Yeah, he was. Uh, he saw them as a threat, and the um, Hamas, as the one of the descendants of the original Brotherhood movement, uh, was not really welcome in Egypt, and he kept a very tight control on the border. Now, it's not clear what uh, uh, Morsi is going to do about that border. If out of this comes a relaxation and better access for Gazans to the outside world in terms of importation, in terms of sending their kids out for higher education, then this will have been seen as a victory for Hamas, uh, that their, their uh, pushback militarily turned out to be a key to a new relationship with Egypt and, and with Israel. Netanyahu, he's facing elections in January. Yeah. Uh, it seems, at least to this distant observer, that foreign adventures are often 
useful. Useful to deflect yeah. attention from domestic problems. I mean, this goes back millennia. Yeah. It's, this, is, this is nothing new. Does then Netanyahu, should he win the election, have the ability to play Nixon to China? Well, in theory, does he have an inc inclination that's the to question. do that? He has the opportunity. I'm not sure he's got, got the, the inclination. inclination. And, and is there political support for such a thing within Israel itself? The support for peace within Israel, and yet there, any leader of Israel today has will recognize that the uh, the population as a whole has moved somewhat to the right politically and they feel comfortable with the situation building a wall to keep uh, infiltrators from the West Bank out of Israel proper, obviously not a complete success, but they feel a sense of security and they've turned away from the very strong concerns they showed at the time of the Oslo Accords in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. There was much more interest in reaching out for a lasting general peace agreement then than there appears to be now. Uh, you know, they consider the Arabs feckless and uh, impossible to deal with. They'll never stick to a bargain, etc. Uh, so the, the heck with it. Uh, we'll, we'll build our state. Well, that isn't going to work in the long run. Their state is part of the region, and the uh, just building higher walls, literally physical walls, uh, without uh, uh, reaching out to the uh, adversaries, to the enemies, is not a prescription for a lasting peace. That's why I, I was struck by a recent book that I just received. I haven't fully read it yet, but uh, I think it brings together a number of writers, Israeli, Jordanian, American, uh, who have been working on the idea of how to get to a peace accord for the last generation and more. And then we've got substantial, you know, sort of academic experts and, you know, former governmental leaders. And this at least appears to be a framework of a framework <coughs> for at least thinking about solutions to the problem, yeah. as well as some concrete suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that struck me in, in, in preparing for this discussion was actually going to the Israeli press itself and see what they were saying, just to get a sense yeah. of what's going on there. And one thing that struck me, and I don't know, I'm, I'm sure this is not representative of, of the Israeli media, but in Haaretz, the, the leading... Uh, newspaper in Israel, Amira Haas writes this article, and just just read some wording. Uh, Obama, too, is just as comfortable performing groveling, bootlicking subservience to Israel as, October, uh, as Obama won was. And then she goes on to say that Israel's, quote, right to defense, a tremendous propaganda victory, and that giving the Israelis carte blanche to do what they do at best that, wallow in their sense of victimhood and ignore Palestinian suffering. I mean, this is tough, tough, tough stuff. Oh, is this, is this a, a, a significant strain in Israeli thinking? Well, this is one very tough lady. She's been writing on this vein for many years now, and she's focused uh, an earlier book on, on Gaza and been in... Uh, very severe in her comments about Israeli treatment of the Gazans and the political situation that, that they uh, they find themselves in. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot freer wheeling criticism of Israeli policy within Israel what, than the, in our country. It seems as, yeah. as if that's given a very superficial reading. It seems that that's the case. Yeah. Why? Why not here? is the question. Well, because I think the uh, position has been effectively presented by the Israeli leadership to the American public, to the American Congress uh, for years now, that they are the, the, uh, the only really first-class victims in world history and continue to be so in the Middle East, where, in fact, they have become the regional superpower, able to pretty well dictate the freedom of movement uh, politically, militarily, uh, on their neighbors. A little bit of false consciousness? Well, uh... <laughs> You're the diplomat. Let's, mo <laughs> let's move on. In this Hamas-Israeli conflict, obviously Abbas and the PLO appear to be weakened. And that gets to the whole discussion of 
what this Israeli state looks like. I mean, if you look at the map and you look at where the West Bank is and where the Gaza, the literal strip is, I mean, there's a lot of space in between. So in one sense, it's, it's almost a nation, a country that's doomed to fail. But what about the politics here? If Abbas is weakened in the West Bank, what does that mean? Because he seems to be, in a sense, the only one that literally can negotiate with the Israelis. Yeah, it's not just uh, Amira Haas who has made the point that, for God's sakes, what are you waiting for, Bibi Netanyahu? You've got a partner for peace. He's been trying to negotiate, and you haven't been listening. But he's, he's blown it, too. Well, he has. He has. I mean, <laughs> yeah. there are no perfect no, uh, specimens. No, not even good uh, ones, least. Yeah. Uh, one of the encouraging things for me that uh, has been evident in the last few days since the ceasefire started was the friendly noises made by the Hamas leadership towards Abbas. And this week, Abbas is going to the United Nations to uh, the raise status the of issue the state, of, right. of the state uh, as a uh, observer state at the uh, at the UN. Uh, Israel has chosen to treat Gaza as an independent state, it has no power of statehood, in fact, uh, but it, suited, it has suited Israeli purposes to keep that division, Hamas against Fatah. And when some, or at least overtures of a friendly nature being made by Gaza, by Hamas, towards the Ramallah leadership, I think that's a plus, and I, I hope that something can be developed on that basis. We have supported the, uh, in effect, supported the Israeli position that uh, uh, Gaza is an illegitimate government, despite it having had a very free election that brought the Hamas to power right. five years ago. Uh, we need to rethink our position on Hamas, and they've got to do some, make some basic changes themselves. But in the Arab Spring atmosphere, there, are, there is a ferment, and there's, there's some stirrings which, which are promising. Oh, Whew. man, after reading all this stuff, it's like, excuse me. I mean, you know, you know boom goes London, boom Paris. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah. let's transition a bit to your experiences as a diplomat. I mean, we've gone through the last several weeks the discussion of Benghazi and the death of uh, Christopher Stevens and three other Americans. Question I have for you is, in a sense, what is the state of diplomacy? You know, does it is, is it something other than coming out of a gun? And also, more, more particularly, the life of a diplomat. You are in Syria in the early 60s, and then you were ambassador in 74, and you, you saw a lot of things. Describe what it was like to be on the ground as a representative of the American government then, and how it appears to be different now. Well, the Syrian government watched our consulate general in Aleppo, uh, uh, but with a relatively light hand in the early 60s. It was part of the United Arab Republic, then there was a coup d'etat, pulled it out of the UAR. The un Union with Egypt. The Union with Egypt, and uh, uh, for about a year it rocked back and forth. There was another coup attempt which didn't succeed, and finally the Baathy coup which brought that government to power in 63. Well. Let's take, for example, the second coup, uh, 62, which was the attempt to put it back uh, with Egypt. Uh, it was bloodless compared to what's been going on in the last few decades uh, with the Iraq war, et cetera. Uh, I felt free to go down to the police headquarters uh, the day, second day of the coup and ask that they you know, have in mind, there were, we had a small community of Americans in uh, Aleppo, and we wanted to assure their protection. But it was also a chance to explore who was saying what to whom at that point. What and a good I, diplomat does. Yeah. So I, I just drove down there, walked in by myself, and realized that in the half-open door in the next office was the body of a man I had known slightly in the Syrian police uh, corps. 
he had died in some kind of shootout the, uh, that day. Uh, the police weren't that happy to see me in their headquarters, and they said, better you go back to the office. And I said, fine. Um, but I couldn't do that today. I mean, there would be a cover squad of security guards uh, accompanying me if I was trying to get to that uh, site today. Um, and you'd the, leave a building that was heavily bunkered and armored? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, the physical basis has changed. The mission of the diplomat has not changed. Damn it, you've got to be out there. You're a very small group of American officials, uh, ideally uh, a number of whom have been trained in the local language and the history so that they have some sense of what they're dealing with. But they're out there to get a feel which doesn't come from the, anyone but the best international journalists. But, if, but you can't get the feel if you're surrounded by a security apparatus and you're in an armored car. Doesn't it make it infinitely more difficult to do that sort of mingling with the masses, if you will, and getting a sense not only among the elites but also what's out there? Yeah, I mean, no administration in Washington wants to have Another. Deaths of its right. diplomats on its hands. Uh, so there is a sense that, look, uh, be careful, and there's much more caution about the movements of diplomats. But, you know, the guys I worked with, uh, it's still the same mentality. You've got to get out. The job requires it uh, to get some uh, feel for the situation. And, and that's what Stevens did when he was Stevens, the end Stevens was it. first class officer at, at doing that. And, uh, there's been some suggestion maybe he was a little playing a little loose on the secu personal security in order to carry out his job. Well, his visit to Benghazi was a public event. He had gone to uh, uh, donate equipment to the local hospital, that sort of thing. Those that wanted to make trouble knew he was there. Mm -hmm. He was very, very popular in Libya as having been one of the key uh, public officials identified with the revolution sure. from our side. But... Um, yeah, apparently this Al Qaeda uh, affiliate had him in their uh, had him in their sights, but uh, right to the end, he was out there trying to communicate. Now, I would I would think that in the immediate aftermath, that the the, the security lockdown almost was was heightened by the administration among its diplomatic corps, again having probably adverse short and long term impacts. Well, you know that that thinking started taking shape back in the early 90s with the bombings of the embassy in Nairobi. Nairobi. And uh, uh, it's never looked back. There's a very heavy contingent of security officers assigned to our embassies. Mm -hmm. um, but they, their mission is to make sure that our guys think twice and that they're able to carry out their job right. while providing protection. Okay, let's very briefly turn to a country where you were posted, and we really don't have that much time, and that is Syria. 40,000 dead. Uh, Sunday, November 25th, New York Times cover story. Cold ravages Syria refugees as aid falters. What's going on? Well, it's a mess, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have a better suggestion uh, for American policy than what's been done. We have been trying to get the message across to the Syrian opposition. Uh, damn it, you are fragmented. You are not pulling together. Yeah, you all want Bashar al-Assad to leave the office, uh, dead or alive. But that's not enough. You've got to come up with a platform that is got, that is inclusive, that provides a uh, sense of security to the minorities, which are very influential and dominant in Syrian political life, be they Alawite or Kurds or Christians. And you, you've got to do a better job than you've done to date. The history of this is not encouraging. Uh, Particularly when you have these religious schisms, you know, Sunni, Shiites, intra-Sunni, intra-Shiite. I mean, religion and culture really gets in the way here. Well. Those coals have always been there under the ashes, mm -hmm. and during the Assad period, uh, 
half, as Allah said, built a quote-unquote secular state. No, I mean, it was giving a privileged position to the Alawites, if you will, but uh, uh, it was not something that you uh, featured was the need to, uh, uh, to guard one sect against another. That was never the public mm -hmm. rhetoric of mm -hmm. the Assads. And I hope that that can be preserved, uh, even with the departure of that particular regime. The, uh, the president has said the administration wants Assad out. What are we, what are we doing? What, what actions are we taking now? What actions might we take? What actions ought we take? Well, I mentioned the political efforts being right. made to get them to pull together and trying to get the message across to would-be arms suppliers from other governments, uh, although uh, the opposition is finding its way to get arms uh, uh, on, through its own channels, but that, uh, you know, try to make sure you know who's going to be getting those arms because there are some very sure. nasty types, minority uh, but uh, very extreme types in the present mix in Syria. So be careful when you start funding and supplying arms. We've got 30 seconds. President calls you. Mr. Ambassador, I'd like you to jot down a couple of ideas about a framework of moving forward in the Middle East. What, what does this memo include? Well, it includes keep your patience. Uh, it's not clear that too many people out there know where they're going at the moment. Uh, we were very pleased with some of the calls we were hearing from the Egyptians uh, two years ago after the overthrow of Mubarak for multi-party democracy, for uh, religious tolerance, etc. cetera. Uh, now the position looks a little uh, murkier, but they need us, they need our support economically to come rebuild the uh, countries, not just Egypt, but several of them. We need to be consistent in, to our principles, stand by the uh, democratic principles we've been talking about for years, long before there was an upheaval. Sure. Uh, but be ready to help uh, recognize we're suspect. For so long we were tied uh, to the regimes which they have gotten rid of. Uh, so don't don't push hard to be active and too visible in what you're doing. Okay, thank you. My thanks to Ambassador Richard Murphy for being on the show and for his usual insightful analysis. Join me next week when my guest will be Mark Dolan talking about rock and roll and the boss, Bruce Springsteen, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.